Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Eastside today. My name is Wayne, one of the associate pastors here, and I am so glad you're here. Blessed to have you. And just before we start our worship this morning, we are going to talk about a few things going on. This coming weekend, a great event. It's the All Church Camp Out and Barbecue. It's up at the Price's home. You go up Marcola Road, Sunderman, back down to Groats Road, and you turn the corner and then you drive right into their house, sort of. If you need to know how to get there. <laughs> this yeah. is all being recorded on the stream, so you can check Facebook later and listen to Wayne give you those directions again. You can talk to these prices down here and they'll tell you how to get there, but I think it's out on the, in the Next Step Center. And speaking of the Next Step Center, you need to know that there's a sign up there. If you're interested in being part of the camp out, there's places for tenting, there's places for RVs, there's places for motorhomes. But if you're going to do that, we ask you to write what you're going to do, tent, trailer, or motorhome, so they know how to plan to have you in the spots there. Now, what is up there? There's the river, and there's a nice little sort of uh, bay area in it. And so on Friday night, 4 o'clock on, people are going up camping. And then on Saturday at 4 o'clock, we are having our picnic. And the church is providing hamburgers, hot dogs, but we're asking you guys to bring side dishes, desserts, <laughs> and the sign-up is out at the next desk so that you can sign up for what you're going to bring, and we really encourage you to come and fellowship. After the barbecue, around 7 o'clock, we're going to have a time of worship. Some people want like a bonfire type effect, but... If it's hot, I doubt we're going to do a bonfire, right? We'll just sort of stay cool. But before 4 o'clock or even after, we're going to have like cornhole set up, a bocce ball, croquet, a few other games to just enjoy together or come out and just visit with each other and have some fun. So that's this coming weekend. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Sunday, if you're camping over Saturday night, Sunday morning, Josh Lucci, our youth pastor, he's going to be staying up there, and he's going to lead a devotional about 11 o'clock that morning, and then people are sort of going to clean up and move on with the rest of the day, and, and, and the barbecue picnic will be over. So that's that event. Now, this afternoon, this evening, at the Grenades House is the young adult meeting, 6 o'clock at the Grenades House. So if you are a young adult, what that means is up to you. You head on over to the Grenades house. If you need directions to get there, let me know. I think all of this is in the bulletin, and you can read that. We're so excited again that you're here this morning. Before we worship, let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is so delightful to be in your house this morning. Thank you we have the opportunity to worship you, to hear your word. But Father, we turn our hearts, our souls right now to concentrate on you, to fully say, you are my God, to rejoice, to praise you, to worship you this morning. May the Holy Spirit lead us, Lord. May your word ignite our hearts to serve you, to grow in you, to know you more. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. turned into wine you opened the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you 
Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. He's awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us And if our God is with us Then what could stand against And if our God is for us Then who could ever stop us And if our God is with us Then what could stand against What could stand against our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand again? Thank you for the cross that you have carried. Thank you for your blood that was shed. You took the weight of sin upon your shoulders. Sacrificed your life so I could live. Thank you for the cross that you have carried. Thank you for your blood that was shed. You 
took the weight of sin upon your shoulders sacrificed your life so i could live now nothing is holding me back from you redeemer of my soul now nothing can hold me back from you your love will never let me go. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love, the whole earth. 
tremble and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all names blessed Father, we thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can be here worshiping you. God, thank you that your presence is always available. God, help us to be more aware of it. It's in Jesus' pray, Jesus' precious name that we that we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. All right, our youth can be dismissed. Thank you, worship team. I love the banjo. That is such a cool sound. Thank you, Christian. So everyone loves a good mystery. Whether it's Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie, maybe you grew up reading the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew. In fact, Byron Forrest, he loved Nancy Drew. That was his favorite growing up. Uh, did anybody here remember Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Remember that? Or Blue's Clues? Blue's Clues, yeah. Where's Waldo? You remember you had to get your little magnifying glass to find Waldo? Personally, I love Scooby-Doo. Shruggy? <laughs> anyway, um, I just introduced my boys to the classic 1970s Scooby-Doo. We downloaded the first... Uh, season, the entire like 14 or 17 episodes, they love Scooby-Doo. I'm like, yes, I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling kids, you know. Anyway, uh, maybe some of you remember playing the game Clue growing up. Anybody play the game Clue, remember? Yeah. Or maybe uh, <clears throat> watching the movie Clue in 1985. It's, I think, the only movie ever made that has three different endings. Yep, and it starred Christopher Lloyd as Professor Plum. There's some useless trivia for you. When I was in Austin, Texas, about 25 years ago, I started a consulting company. It's back in the day when companies had money to pay people to do fun things. <laughs> Those days are long gone. But they would hire me to write a murder mystery. We would rent an old building with secret passages. 
and we would pick out the hams from the company, and they would become the suspects, you know? And everyone would have to split up into teams and search the building for clues. It was the funnest job I think I've ever had. It was awesome. Uh, but, uh, you know, my youngest and I, we love watching Perry Mason. Did anybody ever watch reruns of Perry Mason? Some of you guys watched it when it was, like, first come out, you know. But uh, my, son, my youngest son and I, we have gotten into the first season from 1957. He loves it. Caden can figure out the bad guys within, like, ten minutes. He knows it. I'm like, how do you know that? You know, anyway, good stuff. Some of the more recent murder mysteries include Death on the Nile. It was released this year, and maybe some of you saw the movie Knives Out. It came out in 2019. And, uh, and some of you actually enjoy a relatively new thing over the last 10 years, something called escape rooms. Does anybody enjoy an escape room? Those things are stinking expensive. If you've ever like gone to one, like the other day, like for Father's Day, they were gonna give me an escape room experience, right? And then we called. That'll be hundred and eighty dollars for all four of you, and we're like, no, I think I'll go to Outback. Thank you. But, <laughs> but they are fun. I've done one of them, and uh, we might do one as a staff at some point. Uh, but uh, anyway, good, good stuff. Folks, we love a good mystery, don't we? Um, but there's one thing when you're watching or participating in a mystery that you don't like. And it's when you've gotten all the way to the very end and they're getting ready to unveil everything and the cable goes out. <laughs> or somebody changes the channel. Or for whatever reason, you can't watch the end. You're like, no, you're leaving me hanging, right? It's so frustrating. You know, just last month, uh, before school got out, I dressed up like Detective Harry Fettuccini, and I did a scavenger hunt for the second graders at the school, and uh, the kids loved it, uh, but some of the, the kids were very frustrated because their group had tried to solve all the little clues, and they got to the very end where they're trying to figure out this lock, right, this combination, and they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> of course, there's lots of candy inside, and you know, sugar them up. That's what they do at ECS, you know, and send them home. Uh, but uh, no good stuff. No, actually, they do more than that. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, Jeremy's like, great, we got to do damage control now from ECS. But no, great school. But, uh, but it was very frustrating. There were a few of these teams, and they had done all the hard work, and then somehow they just miscalculated the combination, and they couldn't figure it out. It was very, very frustrating. You know, the Bible speaks about a mystery, a mystery of God's redemptive plan. And if you think about it, the Old Testament prophets, they preached about this mystery of who the Messiah would be. Of course, they didn't know who he was. And many of them went to their grave not even knowing who this Messiah would be. The mystery of the fullness of God. Of course, they know now because they're with Jesus, right? But... Can you imagine preaching your entire life like this Messiah is going to come? And then you die, and you never see it take place. In fact, Jesus said this in Luke 10, 23 and 24 to his disciples, quote, Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews eleven thirteen says it this way: All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, for they saw it from a distance and they welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth, folks. We are blessed because we live on this side of the cross. We live on this side of a completed Bible. And now we know that the great mystery of our faith, also known as the great mystery of godliness, that mystery that the Old Testament saints prophesied about, that we're looking forward to, we know that mystery is Christ, right? Christ. He is the fulfillment of that mystery of God. 
And this book, God's Word, records not only His gospel about the good news of how He came to save us, but also everything we need and how to live a godly life. Last week I mentioned that the great mystery of our faith, or the godliness, is the gospel. And that is true, but you don't have to know everything about Jesus in order to repent and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. For there's so much more, so much beauty and intrigue in getting underneath the amazing twists and the turns of God's amazing plot for redeeming humanity. In other words, as you delve delve deeper into the facts of the case and how they point to the fact that Jesus was and is the Savior of the world, it leads you to a much greater appreciation for what He did for us and all the more reason to revel in the wonder of our Lord and God. Today we're going to be examining the very end of 1 Timothy chapter 3. So hopefully you have a listening guide. Raise your hand. Mr. Craig will give you, he'll make you an airplane, he'll throw it to you. He'll float it over to you if you don't have one. We're going to be looking at the end of chapter 3 and starting with uh, chapter 4. And here's the thing, guys. Uh, If you can go ahead and put up the, the picture. This right here is actually an early manuscript of what we're talking about today. All right, This is an actual picture. And I've said this before, but some of you take great relief because you know who you are. You're those run-on sentence people. You know what I'm talking about? Any run-on sentence people here? (laughs) Yes. In fact, many of us, now that we started texting, we we become lazy. No periods, no punctuation. Well, guys, when God's Word was written in the Greek, do you realize not only was it written in all caps, not only was it written as one long run-on sentence, but there were no spaces between the words. And no chapters and verses. That didn't come about till like the 1200s AD. So there's no problem with ending with chapter 3 and starting with chapter 4 because guess what? It's one complete thought. Does that make sense? So today we're going to be looking at the end of chapter 3 verses 14 through 16 as well as the first five verses of chapter Four. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. And um, again, people ask me, what is the best version? It's the one you read, because in reality, most people don't read the Bible. But if you really want to know the Word of God, you've got to learn Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, and then you know the Bible. But for the rest of us, we have something called English translations. If there's ever any doubt in what the Word of God says, go to a place like BibleHub.com. And look up the Greek word or look up the Hebrew word. You can find out every place it's used. So hopefully that solves the mystery, pardon the pun, um, of what version to read. Okay, let's get into this. Let's start at the very end of chapter 3, 1 Timothy 3, starting in verse 14. Here's what it says. I am writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon. So that if I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Let's stop here and pray. Lord, today I just thank you for the timelessness and the power of your word. I just pray, Lord, that that I would decrease and you would increase today, Lord. May this be about what you are saying to each of us individually, Lord. You speak to our hearts, Lord. Anything that we're worried about, help us to just give that over to you and focus singularly on you, on what you want us to do. Lord, help us to walk out of here changed. We invite you here today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so remember a few weeks ago, um, I started this uh, Timothy uh, journey, 1 Timothy. It's uh, Paul's letter to Timothy on how to pastor a church. And we've been looking most recently at the character qualities of church leaders, particularly elders and deacons. And of course, not all of us are called to be an elder or deacon, but all of us 
in a sense, are called to be a deacon in the sense of being a servant. Diakonos means a servant, right? We're all to serve one another. And of course, this list is not a list of perfection because only Jesus could live up to it, right? But instead, it's, it's more of a way that, that identifies a person who has an overall lifestyle that resembles these qualities. And the, the purpose of the office of elder and deacon is spelled out in verse 15 when it says, "...how people must conduct themselves in the household of God." In other words, Timothy, I'm writing these things to you ahead of time so that if I'm not able to instruct these people directly in Ephesus, that, well, you can show them how to act and how to organize yourselves. This is basically a roadmap on how to do church, how you're to treat one another, how you're to organize, how do you select leaders, what to look for, what to focus on, and so forth. Now... If you'll permit me for just a few minutes, I want to chase an important rabbit. I want to review a rabbit that I preached to you when I first got here. And it's this idea of how to do church. In fact, if you were to sum up what the entire Bible says, particularly the New Testament, because we know the New Testament is about the church, the, the, the new church of God, right? Well, you could sum up how we treat each other in these seven things. It's called the seven heart attitudes. If you can flip over on your, your sheets of paper, please. It is something that I got permission from a guy named Harold Bullock out of Fort Worth, Texas some years ago to use. Now, it's one thing to plant a church. This guy, over the last 30, 40 years, has planted 70-plus churches. And not only that, it's healthy churches. So you have 70 churches and you have 70 healthy churches. And he says, this is, this is what it means. This is how we treat each other. This is what we teach our leaders when it comes to planting a new church. And this is how they stay healthy. So let me just review these real quickly. Um, number one, we're to put the goals and interests of others above your own. Try teaching that to a bunch of toddlers. <laughs> Guys, it doesn't come natural, does it? Right? Because we're selfish. But we've got to put the needs of others above our own. Number two, we need to live an open, honest life before others. In other words, what you see is what you get. Number three, we need to give and receive scriptural correction. That's an unpopular thing to do. <laughs> in fact, I have noticed in my Christian life that the folks who are the most mature spiritually, they can receive instruction, right? A wise person hears a rebuke and it makes them what? Makes them wiser, right? But people who are either lost or they're new believers, they don't want to hear that they're doing wrong, right? They're not ready to receive it. And so that shows immaturity. But to be able to receive scriptural... And by the way, we're really good at giving it, right? <laughs> we're not always that good at receiving it, okay? Number four, we're to clear up relationships, so often, the Holy Spirit, He's grieved when we have little, little yang yang between each other, right? And, and it grieves the Holy Spirit, so we need to clear those things up. Number five, participate in the ministry, all right? Uh, the old uh, Pareti principle, this idea that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, and I've talked about how it's more like 90-10 in most churches today, right? And that's why I've, I've really been putting out a bunch of opportunities for us to serve, and so... It shows maturity when you start to serve in ministry. Number six, this one's real popular, support the work financially. Woohoo! That's all I'll say about that. Number seven, follow scriptural leadership within scriptural limits. Again, these are the seven heart attitudes that if you were to really look at how to do church, I believe this best sums up how to do church. That's how we need to treat one another. Okay. Now that I've summed this up, I'd like to get back to our passage. Paul is again writing to Timothy. He's given some very uh, specific things to do on how to do church, right? How to act, how to live out the Christian life together. Uh, specifically, how church leaders should act, how they should lead, and how they're to serve and to deal with conflict. All right, and then he goes on the rest of verse 15 to say basically that the living God himself entrusted his gospel, his redemptive message, his doctrine to the leaders of his church. 
And by the way, this is not the only time that Paul uses a metaphor of pillars to describe these guardians of truth. For he wrote earlier, much earlier in Galatians 2.9, quote, In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, end quote. In other words, Paul is referring to the living God, uh, and the living God, he's entrusting his truth with what? With t- to who? To people, to the spiritual leaders, right? They're to guard his truth. And by the way, he says living God as in contrast to the dead gods that those people in Ephesus worship. Artemis, Diana, those, those kind of pagan gods who weren't gods at all, that demons were actually empowering these gods. And so he says here, the living God has entrusted these things to you. In fact, it is for this reason the writer of Hebrews writes this, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give account. In other words, they have been entrusted with my truth. They are the guardians, the pillars of the truth. So here he's basically contrasting worshiping the living God, Yahweh, with that of empty idol worship. And of course we know Yahweh is the name of the the Jewish covenant name of God in the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ is fully God. By the way, this idea of empty idol worship, it goes all the way back to the beginning. In fact, Deuteronomy 32 says it this way. And as you listen to this, Tell me if this doesn't sound like the American church today. Listen, it says, verses 15 through 18, it says, But Israel soon became fat and unruly. (laughs) The people grew heavy, plump, and stuffed. I love the New Living Translation. Then they abandoned the God who made them. They made light of the rock of their salvation. They stirred up his jealousy by worshiping foreign gods. They provoked his fury with detestable deeds. They offered sacrifices to demons, which are not God, to gods they had not known before, to new gods once recently arrived, to gods their ancestors had never feared. You neglect the rock who had fathered you. You forgot the God who had given you birth. Guys, that kind of sounds like the American church, doesn't it? Things haven't changed much, have they? Now let's further unpack this mystery of our faith. Uh, Getting back to the rest of verse 16, check this out. It says, Christ was revealed in a human body. All right. In other words, we know that Jesus Christ, being fully God, stepped out of heaven. He took on flesh. And we know John writes about this. John 1, 14, it says basically that he took on The Word became flesh. He became fully human. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. By the way, one of the heresies in that time that was facing this church was that of Gnosticism, with a G, G G-N, Gnosticism. It's the idea that God would never dwell among the flesh. There's no way that God could dwell among the flesh because the flesh was sinful. Well, they got that part right. (laughs) But the idea that God would never be around it, eh, that was bad because we know that Jesus Christ did, right? He loved us so much that He came to us. And in order to be qualified to go to the cross, He had to be 100% God and 100% human. He had to be that way to be qualified to be our Savior. Okay, the next thing our text says is this. He was vindicated by the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, fully God, bears witness or vindicates the fact that Jesus is who He says He was. In fact, He did that all along the way on His life on earth. He bears witness to these claims that He's the Messiah, He's the Son of God, He's fully God. Luke sums this up in Acts 5.32. It says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey Him. By the way, the Holy Spirit is a He, not an It. That's bad theology to refer to the Holy Spirit as an It. He's a person. All right, There are three persons and one God. Right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a He. 
Matthew 3, 16, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. John 15, 26, but I will send you the advocate, the Spirit of truth. He, not it, he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. In other words, he will vindicate me. Remember, Jesus' critics claimed over and over that Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, right? He, he, he basically was accused of being a liar, all right? And we know that the Spirit testified that Jesus was fully God and the Messiah, and yet they're rejecting this. And because of this, I believe they were committing the unpardonable sin. A lot of people wonder, well, what is the unpardonable sin? I believe the unpardonable sin is rejecting the Holy Spirit's call to trust Christ as Savior and Lord. In other words, you're telling the Holy Spirit, you're a liar. And it's very humble. Uh, one of the scariest verses in the Bible, Matthew 12, 32. It says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or the world to come. You see, I believe... And sadly, this is the reality. This is the most important thing I'm going to say today. There will come a time when the Holy Spirit, He will quit tugging at your heart to accept Christ. He will, he will say, that's it. It's too late. Today, let me ask you, if the Holy Spirit is call, calling you to repent and to throw yourself at the mercy of God at Jesus for salvation, trusting that what He did on the cross was good enough for you, you need to do it. Because there may come a day when he's going to quit. And that is very humbling. That's very humbling. Today, do you know that 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 if you were to die, you would go to be with Jesus forever? If you're not sure about that, at some point, get a card, one of those cards in front of us and say, Friar Chuck, I'm not really sure about this. <laughs> Pastor Charlie, help me out here. I will be delighted to not manipulate you, but to, let's just sit down, let's talk about this, let's look at this, the truth, okay, that's huge. Put that in the little box on the way out, and put your number where I can read it, that's important. All right, back to our scripture, it goes on then in verse 16, it says, He, Jesus, was seen by angels. Commentator Jay Erskine says, angels were witnesses of the most important events which concerned the Redeemer. In other words, angels also testified and testify, we see this in Revelation, that Jesus is who he says he is. <clears throat> there are lots of examples of this, but let me just read you Luke 135. This is Mary, the part of the Christmas story. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. There's an angel testifying that Jesus is who he says he is. Moving along, it then says he was accused, I'm sorry, he was announced to the nations so Jesus said of himself, we know in Acts 1.8, it's recorded, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. What? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, I'm going to give you this message of redemption, and you're to announce it everywhere to all the nations of the world. Luke records Paul testifying to King Agrippa. This is very bold. In Acts 26, 23, he says that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. In this way, announce God's light to the Jews and Gentiles alike. In other words, he was announcing this to the nations. Folks, we know that Jesus Christ will be preached to every people group before he comes back. This is crazy to think about. Mark 13, 10, for the good news must first be preached to all nations. Matthew 24, 14, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. They estimate today, right now, there are about 3,000, just a little over 3,000 unreached people groups in the world. In other words, 
groups of people who do not have a copy of God's Word in their own language, or maybe they have never had a missionary come and tell them about Jesus. And that's why these precious groups like Wycliffe and other translators, um, they're, 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 they're working quickly to be able to translate the message of God into these native languages. When I first started hearing about this, I think I was like a teenager, and at that time there were like over 10,000 unreached people groups. Now there's around 3,000. So folks, I believe the end is getting near. I, I, I really do. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess really the question we need to ask ourselves, are we ready? If you do know Christ, well, are you living for Him? Are you ready for Him to return? Moving on, in our text it says, He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. We know that people all over the world have put their faith in Christ. We also know that not only Christ has already ascended back to the Father in heaven and has this glorified body, but the spirits of those who believed in Him and who have gone before Him, uh, they've already joined Him in glory. Not their bodies yet, right? That's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. But the spirit of them have gone to be with Jesus. In case you're wondering... People who know Christ, when they die, their spirits go directly to be with Jesus. They will reside with Jesus in heaven until he comes back to the earth. At that time, their spirit will be matched up to this glorified body which will be fit to live forever. And of course, we know those believers who are still alive, they're going to have their bodies transformed in the blink of an eye. It's going to happen just like that, this new glorified body. So whether you believe you're going to be raptured before the tribulation or sometime during or, or, or at the end, uh, basically this idea that, that our bodies are going to be matched up with our spirits and we will be fit to live forever. Now, there is one denomination, I'm not going to mention which one it is, that teaches a heresy called soul sleep. All right, Soul sleep. It's this idea that you cease to exist when you die, and then somehow when Jesus comes back, all of a sudden you're turned back on again. Mm -mm, that's bad theology. The Bible does not teach that. For we know 2 Corinthians 5.8 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't go into a soul sleep. Folks, the moment you quit breathing, boom, you're there with Jesus. Your spirit goes directly to be in the presence of Jesus when you draw your last breath. I love that. I love that. It's the glorious hope we have in Christ. Let's now move to chapter 4. Remember, Paul is continuing his, his long, long run-on sentence, right? And he's just revealed details about the mystery of our godliness, the mystery of our faith, which is Jesus Christ himself and his gospel, his story of redemption. In other words, Jesus is the truth. And those, those who are guardians of this, they need to be able to protect his message. He then goes on in verse 1 of chapter 4. Okay, so we have a new chapter, although it's one long run on sentence, right? And let me read you what it says in chapter 4. It says this, <clears throat> Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times some will turn away from true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Wow, what does that mean? That's crazy stuff. The actual Greek word here for dead is not dead. It's the word seared. In other words, their spiritual nerve endings are dead. They have rejected God so much. They have sinned so much that it doesn't bother them anymore. You know, the first time you do it, ooh, it's terrible. Second time, eh, kind of bad. Third time, pfft, might as well, you know, stay out all night. Earn that whipping like the, the great theologian, uh, what was his name, Sinbad used to say, right? If you're going to stay out past curfew, don't stay out for 10 minutes. Stay out all night. Earn that whipping, right? So it's kind of this idea that, hey, I've already done it. Might as well just do whatever, right? That's called having your conscience seared, right? The evil Nazi propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, back in the 1930s and 40s, he made a quote very famous. He said this, If you repeat a lie often enough, people will eventually, what? They'll believe it, right? 
We see this happening over and over today, by the way. Now, I believe the specific lies that Satan was telling these people in Ephesus, uh, maybe those specifics are a little bit different than the ones today, but the overall pattern is the same, guys. Christ has always been deceptive, right? And these lies come from spiritual darkness. And what happens is when we believe these things, when we get off track from God's precious word, we get away from the truth of the gospel, what does it do? It diverts us from our mission. It weakens the strength of the pillars of the faith. In context, verse 3, it says this, quote, <clears throat> They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but we should receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. Here, it is quite possible that Paul is referring to some of the early Christian cults, okay? So in other words, they're getting away from the truth of the gospel. They're adding their own weird doctrine to it. And we know some of that could have been Gnostic teaching. I've already mentioned that. But not only that, there's a guy named Marcion, all right, not earth, earth, there would be no earth. Not that guy, not Marvin the Martian, I'm sorry. Okay, but a guy named Martian, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. All right, and he, th this guy was crazy. You know what he said? He said, hey, the, the God of the Old Testament, he was mean, so we're not going to believe that part. <laughs> there are a lot of people who actually believe that today. <laughs> but he said, and by the way, because of the Jewishness of these gospel writers, we're not going to believe that part either. We're only going to believe what Paul said and what Luke wrote about. And that's his whole Bible. And he led people astray. There were people maybe in this church and the beginnings of this idea that were being affected um, in this way. So they were being led astray. Another possibility is that Paul could have been referring to a a, a, a radical sect called the Essenes, a Jewish sect, right? The Qumran community. These are guys that said, you know what? The world is so evil, we're just going to go out in the desert. We're going to hang out. And we're going to do all kinds of weird stuff. We're going to add to God's word. Like, like we're going to forbid marriage. We're going to, um, in fact, I remember seeing a traveling Dead Sea scroll, scroll tour. And one of the things, I mean, they, they regulated everything. Like when you went to the bathroom. Like, can you imagine like living under this kind of ascetic lifestyle? Crazy stuff. But the point is, this could be referring to some of these guys because some of this teaching might have crept into the church. Nevertheless, what did it do? It caused them to get their eyes off of Christ. And instead of being in the world and not of the world to be salt and light, these people were totally removing themselves. And as a result, guess what? They had no witness to the world. It kind of defeated the whole purpose in which Jesus came. Today, there are those who believe that they must keep themselves from anyone who is lost at all costs. So what do they do? They shelter even their kids from ever having anything to do with the world. The problem is that you're falling into the same trap as these people in Ephesus, the people that Paul was writing to with Timothy. You end up not having the ability to win the world to Christ. Now, should we be holy? Should we protect our kids? Absolutely. We, uh, I think there's a time and place. Should we live according to Scripture? Absolutely. But we don't need to go beyond Scripture because we could be led astray. If I can be so bold, I believe if any of us here today are never in the presence of lost people, people who don't know Christ, be it in person or online, I believe you're doing the same thing. You have lost your ability to take the life-changing reality of Christ to the world. This beautiful mystery of our faith, Jesus Christ. Today, if that's the case, maybe you need to ask the Lord to forgive you. You need to repent. So today as our worship team comes forward, I'd like to sum up today's message. It's written on your listening guide. Let me read it to you. It says this, the mystery of our faith, maybe your version says godliness, is Christ himself. That is the mystery, right? We know that is the answer to the mystery, right? And we are to share his gospel and his truth while rejecting lies 
from Satan. Today, are you doing that? Or let me ask it this way. What part of this are you struggling with? Because folks, again, it, you know, it, it, it's one thing to be able to understand what God wants you to do, but if you're not actually doing it, then you're not being obedient. We know Christ is the answer. Are we sharing His gospel? Are we reading God's word so we know what the truth is versus the lies? There are a lot of lies that Satan likes to do in twisting God's word and adding to it. How do you know that what you're watching on YouTube is correct? There's a lot of bad theology on YouTube. Absolutely. Today, what is God calling you to do? Maybe you need to recommit yourself to living out the gospel. Maybe you need to recommit yourself to reading through God's Word. We're doing that as a church. And you can find the reading plan either on the website or on the church planning center app or not uh, the church center app or outside we have some in the lobby we have some little paper copies of where we are so if you want to follow with us or continue doing your Bible your Bible plan I don't want to mess you up if you're already doing another plan but guys we need to know the truth so we can know what is not true so let's pray as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper Lord I, I thank you for your word I thank you for your truth Lord, I think, and I'm just confessing, Lord, there are times that I just take for granted the fact that we have the completed Word of God. I've got so many versions and copies of the Bible. Lord, I take it for granted. Please forgive me, Lord. Lord, may we be about being in Your Word. May we be about sharing Your Word. Being able to guard the truth. You talk about the pillars of the faith, guarding the truth. Today, Lord, I pray if there's any way that we've bought into any kind of lies from the enemy, that, Lord, you would show us what that is. May we confess that. You'll be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, maybe there's someone here today and the Holy Spirit, yes, He has been knocking on your heart for a long time. And you've been running from it because of pride. Because you think you're going to live forever and you're not going to die. Yeah, we are. We know our spirits are going to live forever. But Lord, I just pray today could be the day of salvation. Today could be the day that we say, I'm going to quit running. And I'm going to say yes to Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, maybe this is what you need to say. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't do enough good works. You said in Isaiah, Lord, that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Lord, we are filthy sinners, and there's nothing we can do about it. But Lord, the good news is, the mystery of our faith has been revealed. Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. Thank you, Lord, for going to the cross, for dying, and for resurrecting yourself on the third day. I thank you, Lord, that you paid the penalty for us to be saved. Today, Lord, the best way I know how, I turn from my sin, I turn alone to you for eternal life, believing that what you did is good enough to save me. And all the faith I have... Even faith of a mustard seed is not faith in faith. It's all the faith I have right now I place in you. And I surrender it to you. Here I am, Lord. Whatever you want to do. I can't work for it. I just come as I am. But, but clean me up. Forgive me. Save me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You confess, Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Today, Lord, if there's somebody who doesn't know for sure that, Lord, they would have the courage to come talk to me or one of our pastors or elders or uh, staff or, or deacons or, or any of our ministry leaders, Lord, I pray that they would not tarry. We know, Lord, that ultimately rejecting the Holy Spirit and calling Him a liar is the unpardonable sin. I pray, Lord, maybe today is the last time that 
the Holy Spirit, that, that you're knocking on their heart. May they say yes to you. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, I pray that you would um, just show us if there's anything unclean, may we confess that to you. I thank you, Lord, for the symbolism, the, your broken body and your blood that was spilled for us and broken for us. Right now, Lord, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we believe in open communion. So there are two stations. If you want to prepare your heart and come and get the cup and the, the bread, it's a two-in-one thing. Take it back to your, your chair. Just pray before the Lord and uh, worship him. Thank him for what he did. It's, it's symbolic, of course. The, the, the elements are symbolic. They point to the fact that he died for our sins. But it also is symbolic for the fact that he's coming again. And so you be obedient to what God's telling you to do today. Thanks. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you sing jesus jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Thank you, Father, for the grace that saved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week. It was good to worship with you.